Well, let me mention two. I think, first of all, I was just talking about cooperative learning among students, but we also need cooperation among teachers. So let's say that you are very good with PowerPoint. So you can come up with a very effective PowerPoint. And I'm good at, let's say, doing drawings or uh, bringing art in to the teaching, making videos, etc. So you can do the PowerPoint, I can do the video. And in that way, we're helping each other. We're lessening the load that each of us has. So that's one way. A second thing to think about is something called multiple intelligences. Notice the, the S on intelligence, multiple intelligences. That's saying that there are many ways to learn. And if we just teach in one way, that's good for some students, but it leaves out other students. So the slogan is, the more ways we teach, the more students we reach. The, key, the two key ideas in multiple intelligences are, number one, everyone is smart, but in different ways. We used to think, okay, there's an IQ score, and you take an IQ test, and that tells you how smart you are. So we've got some people up here, some people here, some people here, some people down there. But multiple intelligences says everyone is smart. So that's such an optimistic way to look at education. The second key point is that everyone is smart and everyone can become smarter. So let's say that I'm good at language. Okay, and you're not so good at language, but you're good at maths and I'm not so good at maths. Well, you can get better at language, I can get better at mathematics. We can all improve. Again, uh, it's a very optimistic way of looking at education. So back to the main slogan. The more ways we teach, the more learners we reach. And the great thing about IT, it has so many tools. So one type of intelligence is called musical rhythmic intelligence. For example, we can use songs. You go to the internet, wow, there's so many songs. There's songs with words, there's instrumental songs, there's jazz, there's rock, there's reggae, there's uh, classical music, there's music from so many different countries that we can use to liven up our teaching and to really wake up those students who are high in musical rhythmic intelligence. Or another intelligence is visual spatial intelligence, like what I mentioned before with videos. And we can use graphic organizers, and there's so many of those on the internet. Or there's one, there's one software called Kahoot. Kahoot uses quizzes, but it throws in lots of music, lots of visuals. So that really wakes up the students. And we can take advantage of all those internet tools, like I was mentioning before about Mentimeter. That's just one of so many tools that have come to people's attention. And yeah, it just makes learning not just more interesting, but more inclusive. Because remember, the more ways we teach, the more students we reach. So we want everyone to feel included. Remember I mentioned before about letting everyone be successful. So we use different ways of teaching, more students can be successful. Integrating IT into education has been around for a long time, that idea. But what the pandemic did, it, it really put it front and center. It really told 
everyone. You cannot forget about this. You've got to learn this. You cannot delay. So, yeah, there's, a, there's kind of a saying, a kind of cynical saying in education that if I'm a teacher, I don't like a change. I can ignore it. I can ignore that change. And in five years, it'll be gone. But hey, teaching via IT cannot ignore. It's not going away. It's just going to get more and more. So this really tells all the teachers, even if you're going to retire next year, you got to learn this IT. You've got to integrate it. But one of the good things is, like I said before, we've got our peers. So one of us knows how to use Mentimeter. Another one knows how to use, let's say, there's another technology I like to use called Padlet, P-A-D-L-E-T. So we can help each other. But also, the students can help us because there's a lot of students who really love to use technology. They, they might be quite bored if we're just talking to them, if we're just lecturing them. But once we start to use the IT, yeah, they wake up. They're really interested. So, and remember, when we talk about student-centered learning, students are more responsible. They can choose not just what they learn, but how they learn it. And they can take part. So instead of us doing all the work, us teachers doing all the curriculum development, the students can take part in that. So for example, one thing I like to do is I like to get students to make their own books. Let's say uh, primary school, elementary school students. So they can use the technology. And there's, wow, so many great um, affordances that they can use to create their own books. And they can read, of course, their own books, but their peers can read them. And we can save them, and we can use them next year, et cetera. So it's really democratizing education because there's so many new ways to learn, and everyone can participate. And the students are not tied to the teacher. I can, like, okay, I'm going to the doctor today to find out about something. Well, before I go, I'm going to go to the internet. I'm going to read about this. So, yeah, the doctor knows more than me. No question about it. But I know something, too. I can have a better understanding. So yeah, my teacher knows more than me, but I can go out, I can learn things, and maybe I'll know something that my teacher doesn't know because teachers need to be learners too. And so it's exciting to me as a teacher when my students come to me and tell me something that I didn't know. They found a website I never visited. I don't say, I don't feel like inadequate. I feel, I feel that I feel empowered. I feel enriched by what my students are adding to my life. Like, i sorry to tell so many medical stories, but I went with my wife to a medical appointment of hers earlier this week. And she started off by asking the doctor a question. And the doctor said, I don't know. <laughs> it was so refreshing to hear a doctor say, I don't know. And for us teachers, it used to be the same way. We used to feel, I cannot tell my students, I don't know, because then I lose face. I'm supposed to know I'm the teacher. But nobody knows there's so much knowledge out there, and so much of what we know might not be right. So we always have to be learners, lifelong learners. It isn't just for our students, but it's for us teachers too, to be lifelong learners. Well, uh, in the Singapore context, the Singapore Ministry of Education is definitely into lifelong learning. They talk a lot about that. 
there's a website if you want to visit it. Uh, it's called 21st Century Competencies. It's part, it's produced by the Ministry of Education. And yeah, lifelong learning and multiple intelligences, cooperative, cooperative learning, all of those are key parts of what the ministry does. And so having exams is not in contradiction to cooperation. So there's a famous educational psychologist named Vygotsky. Vygotsky talked about scaffolding. Scaffolding means giving support. So in the typical classroom, the teacher is the only one giving support to the students, the only one preparing the students to do well on exams. Like last night, I was watching a film, a Singapore film about a teacher. There aren't many of those films. I don't recommend this film, but this, this teacher was a, a Chinese language teacher teaching secondary school. And she had, she was doing a remedial class for some of her students who weren't doing well because the exams were coming up. But what she did was she just taught and the students sat alone, they worked alone and they tried to learn. So the teacher scaffolding, the teacher supporting the students, yes, very important, but why not the peers supporting each other? And the students going to the internet to learn too. The teacher can recommend, this is a good site, go here, you can, you can learn even more. It's just like with extensive reading. Nowadays, there's so much online that is written especially for students. It's not like you got to read something written for native speakers, educated native speakers. No, there's lots of stuff for people who are lower proficiency in, in the language. So we've got the teacher helping us. That's been there all along. But the peers, that's another source of scaffolding. And every classroom has only one teacher, but many students. And going online, that's another source of scaffolding. And that is endless. The, the amount of help that students can get online for free. Now, I'm not, that's not even talking about paid, but for free is also pretty much endless. So therefore, yeah, exams are good because one principle in cooperative learning is called individual accountability. Individual accountability. That means everyone has to do their fair share in the group. I cannot let my partners do all the work. I have to do my fair share. And an exam tells me at the end of the day, yeah, I can work with my partners. My partners can help me. But at the end of the day, I'm going to have to do it on my own. But unfortunately, this is my experience that some students think I shouldn't help other students because that helps them and it doesn't help me. So let's say, like I was talking to one Singaporean student. She was a university student, but she told me that back when she was in primary school, elementary school, her parents said, you should always study alone, even for the, the PLSE, which is the exam that Singapore children take at the end of primary six. But that is so wrong because, like I said before, those who teach learn twice. And every teacher knows that. When we teach our students, we learn too. So we have to help students change their attitudes to see that when they're helping each other, they're helping themselves. So that's going to contribute to them scoring higher on the PSLE. Uh, right, good question. Because 
we live, unfortunately, in a competitive society. So there's so much that society does that goes against cooperation. And so if the, if the parents can contribute, if the parents can talk about how cooperation helps them, whether it's at, let's say, the mom likes to play badminton and she plays doubles. And so she and her partner are playing together and helping each other. Or let's say the dad sings in a choir. So they all have to work together. If one person doesn't sing well, the whole sound is affected. So yeah, we have to stress that. And we, we shouldn't be like the parents of that, the university student I was telling you about, whose parents said, don't help. But we, we want to change that attitude. We want to show that life is about cooperation. Even if you take like a candy bar, Okay, if you look at the list of ingredients, the chocolate, the nuts, the sugar, all the things that go into a candy bar, they come from all over the world. And that does, that's not to mention shipping, the packaging of the candy bar, getting it in the store. There's thousands of people involved in pretty much everything in life. And it's just getting more and more. Light, uh, the whole world is getting more and more interdependent. We need each other. And I mentioned before about how working together isn't easy. We have disagreements. Like I have a niece who studies at university and uh, I've been talking to her about cooperative learning for a long time, but she doesn't like it because she has too many group mates who don't feel the individual accountability that I mentioned. They don't do their fair share. And even at university, uh, a couple about, well, this is right before the pandemic. She had to go to the lecture and complain that two of her group mates weren't doing their fair share. So we really need to know how to deal with these issues how to work well in a group, how to deal with the problems that will inevitably arise in groups. So hopefully, if we can teach students how to work together well, we can let them have the experience in class, see the benefit for themselves, then they'll try more. They'll try to cooperate more. They'll have more positive experiences, and then the whole world can be a more cooperative place. Well, I think one thing is we should be, we shouldn't be afraid to fail because that's an important part of learning. We try, we fail, we learn from that. The, Prime Minister of Singapore, Lee Hsien Long, has a saying, which I probably can't remember exactly, but uh, try, fail, fail fast, learn, try again. So that's the idea. So we should try projects. We should learn from them. We fail, we succeed, we should learn. But a lot of people say we can learn more by failing than by succeeding. Because when we succeed, we think, hey, everything is great, no, no need to improve. But when we fail, we see, yikes. Like, I like to publish papers in journals, articles in journals. But uh, about a month ago, I had written an article with some other people, rejected by the journal. But the, one of the editors kindly gave a long list of all the things that we didn't do very well. So yeah, I kept that. I didn't, I, I felt like pressing delete. So I never have to look at that bad news again. But I said, no. So I kept that. And every time I write an article now, I look at that and I try to see, have I done those things that 
that editor told me I should have done. And so I try to learn from those failures. In addition to, yeah, okay. Uh, another point in learning, another theory in learning that I'm really fond of is called positive psychology. Positive psychology, which is different from the old way of doing psychology. The old way of doing psychology was looking at the problems that people have. So if you go to a psychologist's office, you sit down on the couch or on a chair, what do you think is the first question the psychologist is going to ask you? The first question typically is, what's your problem? But with positive psychology, the first question that the psychologist or whoever's going to ask you is, what's going well in your life? What are your strengths? So that, that's what I do when I meet somebody I haven't met before. The first thing I ask them is, what was one of the highlights of your week so far? And the idea is to build on those good things that people do. So instead of taking somebody who wants to commit suicide, of course, those people need our help too. Let's take the average person and let's try to get them not from suicidal to okay. We want to take the average person and get them from average to great. And everybody can do that. And that's what positive psychology tries to do. And a key aspect is meaning. That is, what we're doing is meaningful for us. It's important to us. So if we want lifelong learning, we've got to, we, people have got to figure out what is their passion? What are their passions in life? What do they really want to do? And if they have those, if they identify those, if they work on those, then they're really going to try and try again. And if they fail, no worries. They're going to keep going. So it's very important. Like I have a friend who's kind of famous in education. His name is Pasi Salberg, S-A-H-L-B-E-R-G. He's from Finland. And Finland is kind of famous in education. And so he's got a son. I don't know how old he is now, but at the time he was about 19. So I asked him, how's your son doing? He said, very well, because he found his passion. He knows what he wants to do in life. And because of that, he's going to continue learning. There's a famous psychologist named Carl Carl Rogers, R-O-G-E-R-S. And he said his definition of learning is not just sitting there and doing what the teacher tells you. That's the teacher-centered way. The student-centered way is that you're doing what you're really keen on, what you're really interested, what you're really interested in. And in his example, it was about a boy interested in cars. So he, he had a car. He wanted to make his car go as fast as possible, look as nice as possible, all the features of a top car. So he was insatiable. The boy was insatiable about learning how to make his car even better. And so if we can help students identify what are their passions? We can give them a reason for learning, not just to get a good grade, not just to make their teacher or their parents happy, but what they really care about. Then I think they have a, a good chance to be lifelong learners. Right. Well, actually, I teach a course on adult learning. And so I've thought about this a lot. But like I said, I also believe in learning too. So about two months ago, I took a course on geragogy. Geragogy, you know, like the word geriatric, 
is teaching seniors. So nowadays, some people differentiate between pedagogy, teaching children, and dragogy, teaching adults, in, so shall we say adults maybe to age 60, and then jeragogy, teaching senior citizens from 60 and up. So yeah, there are certainly differences in between the three groups, but I still think that student-centered learning is the key for all of them. But part of student-centered learning is taking the students from where they're at now. So uh, part of that also is understanding their interests, understanding their strengths. So like you mentioned, young children, they, maybe their vocabularies aren't very big. Maybe they can't write at all, but they can still express themselves. We can still try to understand them. So there's something in English, it's called invented spelling. Invented spelling means the, the child doesn't know how to write. They, they can't read and write, but they see people writing. And so we give them a pencil or a pen and they just write and they tell us what they wrote. <laughs> and, that's, and so it's their story. We let them come up with the story and they tell us their story and they write it. And, you know, maybe they know a few letters, but there's, it's not English at all. But it, they're still writing. They're still expressing themselves. They can do a drawing to illustrate their story. So everyone can express themselves. Or like I was on Zoom with a grand niece of mine who's about, at the time she was two years old. So she was talking to me. And I said to my nephew, you know, who's about 25, I said, what did she say? <laughs> I had no idea what she was saying. But he, he knew what she said because he talks to her a lot so he can understand her. So that's what I mean. We have to try and understand everybody, starting from where they're at including young children. But I think it's true that this virtual learning is more difficult with young children. That's what, that's what everyone tells me. That, because personally, I don't really have experience with young children doing virtual learning. But people who do, that's what they tell me. And that's why it's really so unfortunate with COVID. So, yeah, we, we need to use student-centered learning regardless of the age. And part of that is understanding where the students are at and starting from there. Like Vygotsky, to go back to him, scaffolding is an important idea. But another idea that is famous from Vygotsky is called zone of proximal development. So proximal development means what they're ready to learn next. And that is different for everyone. So if we try to teach my two-year-old grandniece about algebra, she's not ready for that. She's ready to learn one, two, three. So it's all about that. And regardless of who you're talking to, who you're teaching, what their age is, we always have to remember this zone of proximal development. And that goes back to what I was saying before about helping everyone to be successful. One trend is trying to increase access. In other words, I remember maybe 10 years ago or more they were talking about developing the $100 computer. In other words, like a laptop that only costs $100 and different companies were working on that. But it didn't really happen, at least as far as I know. So the idea was to make the technology cheap enough so that almost everyone could have a laptop or maybe the phone. Because I, I see nowadays 
so many people are doing things on their phone. Whereas like me, you know, I'm kind of old fashioned. I don't like to do stuff on my phone except talk, but I mostly like to use on my laptop. So I think the technology is getting better. So like now we have 4G and some places have 5G. So we can do a lot more. The question is, we don't just want it for the people in the higher income brackets in the world, in the countries that are developed. We want to expand it to countries that have lower income levels. And I, I remember, I, I know somebody, he was working to put satellites over different parts of Africa so that people could, could get access to the internet. Uh, of course, he was doing this for Facebook, you know, so that's in Facebook's interest. But people who maybe have more benign uh, intentions, trying to get that so everyone can, can have this technology. Maybe that means some subsidizing by governments or companies or other organizations, schools, so that more people can get access, so we have greater equity. Like I was just reading an article uh, this morning about the admission system to Harvard and other elite universities. So they're doing more to have more racial diversity, but economically, it's still people from the upper levels of society in the world who are sending their children to elite universities. So we want to do everything we can to let everyone have the access to the internet because yeah, there's so many free things on the internet. You can learn so much. Like uh, during the pandemic, I took a couple courses, one about IT and education and one about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And they weren't free, but they were a whole lot cheaper than taking a course at a university, even though these courses were offered at universities like Columbia University or University of Illinois in the United States. So these are top universities, but I could attend the courses with top professors for so much less. Right. Well, that's an easy question for me because as I mentioned before, I'm really into this cooperative learning, having the students work together, learn from each other. And I think there's still a lot that technology can do. First, everyone needs access, but we need the technologies that facilitate this interaction. So like I mentioned before, not all the virtual learning platforms have the have something like breakout rooms so that students can work in groups during class time. So I would really like to see more of that happening, more technology where they can work in groups. Like I mentioned before about this Kahoot, which is a kind of like quiz software. But the problem with Kahoot is it's time is very fast. So students don't have a chance to work together. It's just, it's more or less each person on their own answering. So how can we change that? How can we use this technology to facilitate cooperation? Because the research says, and there's thousands of studies in so many different fields with so many different ages of students that when students work together, they learn more. So we need this this virtual, uh, these IT affordances to cover not just lectures talking to students, not just more teacher-centered learning, but also how to facilitate the student-centered learning. And a lot of that involves using groups. So we, I hope that the researchers, both researchers in education as well as researchers in technology will 
focus more on this. For example, one principle in cooperative learning is called equal opportunity to participate. In other words, all the group members get an equal chance to take part in the group. But because too often that doesn't happen, one or two people dominate the group and the others don't get a chance. And when they dominate the group, that means they're the ones doing the learning. But also, they're not getting, not only are the more silent ones not getting a chance to learn, but they're not getting a chance to contribute their ideas. So it's a much richer learning experience when everyone gets a chance to participate. Therefore, what I'd like to see is technology that can tell the group how well are they doing. Let's say they talked for 20 minutes. Well, how much did each member speak during those 20 minutes? Now, there are various techniques we can use, like talking chips. Every time you talk, you give up a chip. We don't have any more chips, you can't talk anymore. But IT can make this happen even better, can make it even clearer how much each person contributed. Now, we're not saying that everyone has to speak at 100% equal amount, but it should be roughly equal. The opportunity to participate should be roughly equal. And that's one thing I like about the asynchronous communication. You know, there's synchronous where everyone is online at the same time, but the asynchronous where people can contribute at different times, like email is an example of asynchronous technology. Well, that gives the people, like maybe they're more introvert. They like to think first. They like to consider before they say. So I think that can really help promote this equal opportunity to participate. Well, I think the fact that you can, asynchronous is good because you, you're not competing with people for airtime. In other words, like we're having a discussion, a live discussion. Well, some people are just a little bit more aggressive and they're gonna be the ones who talk. But if we do something more asynchronous, then I can say what I wanna say when I wanna say it. I don't have to try to beat you. Whenever there's a, a quiet second, I try to get in there. But with the asynchronous, I can contribute anytime I want. Yeah, for example, one thing I like to do is have students do journal entries. So we've talked about something in class, they've read things, they've watched videos, and then they're supposed to give their own ideas. But in addition to giving their own ideas, posting their own journal entries, they also have to give feedback on peers' journal entries. So we try to get some kind of dialogue going among the students. And so this is a kind of asynchronous technology and we can improve it as the technology improves uh, new ways to enter the comments or the comments can be spoken, not just written, or we can have some way to collect and evaluate, analyze students' comments over the course of the term, things like that can, can really make this more vibrant.